welcome everybody uh, to this session. Before we, before to start, I would like to express my gratitude to the U.S. Embassy in Madrid uh, and all the staff involved in this initiative, especially Sandra Sanchez and all the people and the other members that uh, are working behind the lines. And, and also the crew at S Global Magazine, Beatriz, Marta, and, and the other girls, and of course, Cristina Manzano, which is, who is here with us today. Uh, and uh, these greetings uh, and thanks are not only a protocolary thing, because uh, when we uh, started to work together, they, they, they provide us a, a wide variety of topics to choose from, and we decided to go to go rogue and choose a different one. And they always uh, were helpful, and also they were um, willing uh, to 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 develop our idea, which is to to discuss about erosion of democracy and the challenges for in the international security. And um, for this topic, uh, we we. We have with us uh, uh, David Salvo, which is uh, a fantastic guest. Uh, so I am the host. Welcome to the University of Castilla-La Mancha. This is your home, at least your academic home <laughs> for this uh, session. And um, uh, mm, I think this is my, my welcome, Cristina. Uh, do you want to follow from here? Yes, thank you very much, Hector, and uh, welcome everyone to this new session of uh, pro the program Defensa EO. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may have participated last year. Uh, this is a program that we run together and thanks to the support of the Embassy of the US in Spain. And our aim is to foster the culture of defense, is to, to make you more aware of what are the challenges for our security and defense in, in our de democratic societies. And uh, to tell you the truth, Hector, I'm very glad that you chose this topic, uh, that you changed the focus of, of um, the, the other proposed topics, because uh, certainly the erosion of democracy is one of the biggest challenges uh, for our societies. So it's very good that we have today with us, uh, David, to help us understand what are those challenges and how can we confront them? But before giving you the floor, David, let me give you a couple of tips for this program and this session. As Hector mentioned, the, the session is being recorded, so you will you will be able to go back to the to the recording on, on S Global. Um, you are also more than welcome and invited to participate in the competition, which is the second part of this program. Um, in that competition, you you have the basis on, on S Global side too. You are requested to provide your inputs of what you want, uh, of what you think it's more interesting that you have learned today about the erosion of democracy uh, in whatever format. As I said, you have the basis there. And the winner, the prize, as you know, it's a trip to Brussels together with the other winners of the other universities to visit NATO's headquarters and other institutions related to security. So it's a huge prize, I can tell you. It's a, it's something very, very interesting. Um, for those of you who have not registered in our um, form, I invite you to do so because only those who are registered will be able to participate in the competition. And um, without further ado, I just want to introduce you, David Salvo. David is a senior researcher and director of the program Alliance for the Security of Democracy at the German Marshall Fund. The German Marshall Fund, for those of you who don't know it, it's one of the largest and most important think tanks on transatlantic relations uh, in the world. So David, uh, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and the floor is all yours. Well, thanks, Christina. Thank you, Professor. Thanks to the embassy. And good to see all of you. It's it's nice to spend the morning um, talking about <laughs> not the happiest topic in the world, but an important one, and obviously on the uh, the top of the agenda for for everyone in the transatlantic community these days. Threats to democracy. What it means um, for for Spain, for the United States, for the transatlantic community. Um, as Christina mentioned, I'm the, the director of an organization called the Alliance for Securing Democracy. We're at the German Marshall Fund. As Christina explained, what we do is track what we call asymmetric threats to democracy. So by that, we mean 
threats that aren't kinetic or military necessarily uh, by design. So everything from disinformation or cyber attacks, um, malign finance, so the cor corruption in the use of dirty money to infiltrate our politics, the subversion of civil society groups. These are all asymmetric threats that we categorize um, and that we track and analyze and understand how they lead to the erosion of democratic institutions, democratic elections, democratic societies. We focus primarily on the transatlantic community, um, which makes sense since, as Christina mentioned, we're housed at the German Marshall Fund. But increasingly, our scope is global as there are democracies all over the globe that are under threat, both from within and from external actors. So what I thought I would do in my remarks is sort of outline um, the state of play, the problems that we're seeing inside established democracies today, um, how that plays into the hands of our foreign state-sponsored adversaries. And here I'm focused pretty specifically on Russia and China, although we, we also track other state-sponsored threats from countries like Iran. Um, I, you know, I'll explain some of the motivations behind why Russia and China may be working to, or are working to try to further amplify uh, distrust in, in our democracies. And, you know, then I will probably try to show, if I'm able to show, to share my screen, and I think I am, I will show some examples of how this has affected Spain and how this affects sort of Latin America more broadly, as, as Latin America in particular is increasingly in the um, the crosshairs, let's say, of, of Russia and China. So threats to democracy today. Obviously, there's a war raging in Europe, so it's hard to, to talk about threats to democracy without talking about the military problem, even if that's not necessarily what my organization focuses on. The war in Ukraine is much bigger than just a war for territory. Um, this is truly an ideological conflict at its heart. It is about an authoritarian country, an authoritarian regime um, that is frightened by the prospects of its neighbor joining the Euro-Atlantic community, becoming an established democracy, trying to shed corruption, trying to weaken its ties to its east and strengthen its ties to its west. It, it, the war in Ukraine really is more than just a land grab. Um, and I, you know, I'm a former U.S. diplomat. I lived in Russia for three years. I was there covering the Russian military when Russia annexed or par annexed parts of Georgia um, or, you know, invaded parts of Georgia and now sort of recognizes these areas as independent states. Even back then, this was this was a war about democracy versus authoritarianism. Um, it was an attempt to derail Georgia's NATO accession, Georgia's EU membership path. Um, and what we're seeing in Ukraine is just happening on a much larger, much deadlier and, and much more tragic scale. So this sort of existential threat to democracy is happening um, in a very kinetic and very military way. But under the surface, in all of our countries, in Spain, in the United States, in all EU member states and around the globe, there are these other threats that are taking place that start really with us. So let's leave Russia and China to the side for a moment and sort of understand what's happening inside all of our democracies. As an American, I've watched this very acutely in my own country over the last several years, but Spain has its own history and several other European countries has have their history with authoritarian and autocratic tendencies or, or actual governments. Um, but you know what we are witnessing, I think across the Euro-Atlantic space is a rise in polarization, a rise in distrust in elections, in institutions, in the capacity of government to actually carry out its duties towards its people. We're seeing a fragmentation of political of the sort of known political uh, alliances, left and right don't matter as much anymore as they once did. You're seeing sort of common threads between far left and far right. Um, you're seeing distrust in NATO and the EU and what the Euro-Atlantic community means and what, it, what that 
represents for the people of Europe, for the for the people of the United States and Canada. So it's a very um, fluid and fragile time for democracy inside, just, just dealing with our own domestic voices, our own domestic distrust. Um, and Russia and China don't have anything to do with that. They didn't cause those problems. So this is truly a problem that we've created for ourselves. Um, and ultimately we have to solve for ourselves. And what is so dangerous about this is this instability inside our own democracies, it not only, it not only leads to unpredictability in our own domestic politics, you know, it not only leads to question marks about whether there will be a peaceful transfer of power from one government to another, um, it also disrupts the entire geopolitical system internationally. So fortunately, over something like Ukraine, you've seen unity again reemerge between Europe and the United States about how to defend a democratic country uh, pursuing its own sovereign path. But prior to the invasion, you started to you really started to see how the bonds between the United States and Europe were fraying. And part of that was because you had voices in Europe and in the United States sort of asserting national sovereignty over these, you know, these established sort of international geopolitical order. That's all well and good. Those, I'm not saying those voices are invalid. They are a natural part of domestic political life, but they were voices that were largely on the margins of the domestic political system that were now being amplified and and in some cases like in my country you know they became actually part of, of the ruling governments so you had sort of an upending of of a lot of um traditional domestic uh political orders in a lot of our countries and you had voices internally that were amplifying and echoing um distrust in in government um, and institutions and election integrity. And that, you know, is very dangerous. It also plays into the hands of our authoritarian adversaries like Russia and China. So how does this, like, why does this work to the advantage of authoritarian countries? Well, Russia and China have their own reasons for wanting countries like Spain and the United States or blocks like the EU and NATO to be weak. First of all, there are domestic political reasons why authoritarian regimes want democracies to be weak. First and foremost, authoritarian regimes are inherently unstable. Unstable. Um, I think you know we've all of our countries have flirted with authoritarianism in some shape or form, um, and those governments ultimately collapse because they are inherently unstable. And Russia and China, Russia in particular they have to be able to justify to their own citizens why they should continue to tolerate um, such repressive regimes at home. This is particularly true in the case of Russia, which is a declining power, unlike China, it's a declining power. It is um, increasingly isolated on the global stage. It is economically more isolated than it ever has been in the last 25 years. And it is you know, it is unable to provide a sort of veneer of justification um, to its own citizens about why it's a better form of government than the democratic West. Now, when the West, when democracies in the West are unstable, when they're fighting amongst themselves, when they can't have peaceful elections without sort of going to the courts and litigating, um, you know, who should be the president or prime minister of a particular country, it's very easy for the Kremlin and for the Chinese Communist Party to point a finger at us and say to their own people, do you really want to end up like the United States? They can't have an election without millions and millions of Americans uh, calling into question whether the election was held freely and fairly. So it's easy then for them, for domestic political purposes, um, to justify their authoritarianism. And it's, it gives them every incentive to try to amplify and exacerbate those tensions within our countries. There's also foreign policy considerations for Russia and China. 
if we are so consumed by our own domestic problems, if the EU and the United States can't do anything but be all consumed by um, litigating the outcome of an election, about fighting over transfer of power, well, then we're distracted from our global responsibilities. The transatlantic alliance is inherently weakened. Um, our attention on issues and countries of interest to Russia and China go down. Um, so there's every reason for Russia and China to want to pour fuel on the fire, as we say, and want and try to amplify and exacerbate those divisions in our country. So how do they do that? Well, through these subkinetic sort of asymmetric threat vectors, information manipulation and disinformation, cyber attacks to paralyze governments and institutions and banks and media organizations and hospitals, um, making sure that money from these countries infiltrates our country, infiltrates our political systems, often legally using loopholes in our financial legislation to then pollute our politics and make its way into supporting vo voices and, and political actors in our societies who are either out and out autocrats or who are more likely to support a sort of pro-Russian or pro-Chinese pro worldview on the global stage. So there are all these ways in which Russia and China can sort of quietly or not so quietly um, pour fuel on the fire and amplify these autocratic voices within our own countries and deepen divisions um, and exacerbate tensions so that all of our democracies are sort of all consumed by these domestic problems so that we lose faith in our own elections, in our own institutions, and in ourselves as a, as a sort of cohesive society. That's ultimately their goal. I'll talk briefly about the United States and what happened to us in 2016 before I sort of pivot to Spain and Latin America, because I think it's instructive of the ways in which foreign actors can help us do even more damage to ourselves over the long term. So as many of you know, in 2016, Donald Trump was elected president in the United States. There was a massive campaign, interference campaign by the Russian government um, designed to help him get elected. Now, I will tell you, it is not my belief that the Russian government, um, it, it is my belief that Donald Trump was elected to the United States uh, presidency, not because of the Russian interference campaign, um, but because millions of Americans legitimately voted for him. However, I do think that there was a massive interference campaign to try to influence views in American society um, that would be more favorable towards Donald Trump. And it did, and the Russian government did this in numerous ways. It did this by hacking into political organizations and leaking that material on WikiLeaks. It did that by penetrating voting systems in many uh, U.S. states to at least give the impression that um, voting results could be manipulated. It did this by launching massive uh, disinformation campaigns on social media, on Facebook and Twitter in particular, trying to get um, Americans to believe that there were authentic American voices um, that were pro-Trump when actually they were Russian troll farm accounts that were uh, giving the impression that they were ordinary Americans. So it was a very multi-pronged um, and, and sophisticated, frankly, attack on American democracy designed to get Donald Trump elected. Now, I do not believe that the Russian government intend, thought that Donald Trump would actually get elected president. Nobody really thought that Donald Trump would get elected president, uh, including in the Kremlin, until maybe the, a couple of months before the election. So I do not believe that the Russian government's original intention in launching an interference campaign in our election was to get Donald Trump elected. What was their intention then? it was to cause chaos in American democracy. And it succeeded. It succeeded. To this day, we are facing the effects of the what happened in the 2016 presidential election. And I don't mean that you know Trump, Trump is no longer in office. Yes, he's running for the presidency again. Um, but regardless of whether he wins or loses, the intention of the Russian interference campaign was to create even more chaos, more division, more tensions within the American political system and American society. 
that is still happening today. Um, we have millions of Americans who believe that our election system is hopelessly rigged against them. So they do not believe that elections are conducted freely and fairly. That is very scary. And in fact, we were bracing for potential violence in our most recent midterm elections last year because so many candidates were running on a platform of election denialism, making claims that the vote would be rigged. Now, fortunately, that by and large did not happen, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen in the future. That is a direct byproduct. You could trace a, a line from the, the, the poisonous atmosphere of the 2016 election and having a president and then in 2020 call into question the integrity of the election system. Uh, and to this day, there's ripple effects of that in American society. So that you see how information can be used and manipulated to essentially poison the atmosphere and create distrust in, in how elections are conducted, how democracy works, how institutions work. And it's even worse if you get elected officials in, in established democracies who espouse these theories. And in our case, at least, there were foreign actors pouring fuel on the fire, um, helping to amplify those voices in American society. So there's this nexus between these foreign authoritarians and domestic I, I will call them autocrats in some respects. In some cases, they aren't autocrats. They're just polarizing views uh, of figures. But you have foreign actors behind them who want those voices to be heard even la more loudly in our countries. So that's a bit of, of background um, about what, you know, what happened here in the United States. I think it's really instructive because it's not about necessarily one political candidate or making sure that you know one particular person is in office. It's about creating chaos and confusion and distrust in our societies so that essentially society is so polarized that we lose sort of a cohesive sort of national identity. We lose an ability to trust our, our own government and to conduct itself freely and fairly on behalf of all Americans or Spaniards. So that's a driving factor behind um, actors like Russia and China in trying to interfere in our, how our own democracies work. I'm going to show a few slides that are relevant to Spain and Latin America, because I, I don't want this to be singularly about the United States. Obviously, you probably all care more about what happens in your own country, obviously, than what happens in mine. Um, so I will do this quickly. Hopefully this works. Can everybody see the screen? Great, okay, I got a thumbs up. So let me explain what you're looking at. We have, in my organization, we have these online research tools that track Russian, Chinese, and Iranian state-sponsored information uh, narratives um, from their official media accounts, from their official government and diplomatic accounts all over the world. So what you're looking at on the left here, this is our Hamilton dashboard tracking Russian media accounts all over the world. And you might be able to see here in the second line, RT and Espanol. And RT Espanol receives more fa Facebook followers than any other Russian uh, media account in the world. So. Russia is very focused on the Spanish language, very focused on Latin America in trying to influence views in Spain and Latin America um, so that more people in your country are favorable to a pro-Kremlin worldview on issues like Ukraine, on issues that are polarizing in our societies like the coronavirus, um, on, on social issues like gay marriage. Like these are issues that you will see amplified often um, are on RT Espanol to try to generate distrust in the United States, in the European Union, in NATO, and to get more sympathetic views towards uh, the Russian government's worldview. The Chinese government also has um, a an, an uh, CGT and an Espanol account, but it's, it's not the primary focus in the way that um, it is for the Russian government. On this next slide, you will see that RT and Espanol is 
more is the most engaged with here is receives more likes than any other um, news outlet in Latin America. So RT and Espanol by these metrics outperform CNN and Espanol, uh, Deutsche Welle Espanol, Univision. Uh, so all these Western media outlets are underperforming on Facebook compared to RT and Espanol. So it shows you, um, you know, the, the kind of attention that Russia is trying to attract among Latin Americans, among Spaniards towards its worldview. I'll also show you quickly. So this is our tool. Um, this is the Hamilton dashboard. And what I've done is I've pulled up RT and Espanol's past week of tweeting. Um, over a thousand tweets in the past week, um, RT and Espanol has had. And I'll pull up the top tweets by retweet. And you could see right here, right, it's very obvious the type of narratives that uh, RT and Espanol is trying to promote among the people of Spain and Latin America. Um, the Ukrainian government has been killing its people in Donbass for eight years, obviously trying to um, diminish support for the war, Western support for the war in Ukraine. Here you have um, a tweet about the president of uh, Mexico. And, um, you know, you, you will see very frequently RT and Espanol sort of disparage rule, rulers of particular countries that it does not like because it perceives them as hostile to the Kremlin's worldview. So here you have um, a disparaging tweet about the Mexican president. You have uh, tweets um, trying to um, show how Latin America needs to compete against the United States um, in the Lithium tri Triangle. So this is Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. So again, you have a tweet on China accusing the US of causing humanitarian disasters in Syria with illegal interference. So it's very obvious the type of, of, of worldview that this official Russian government media organization is promoting in the Spanish language. By the way, these are all auto-translated into English. All these tweets that you see are actually in the Spanish language. Um, so don't think that this is only happening in English. It's not. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of the type of information manipulation that is happening officially, overtly. This is not covert. Um, this is all attributable to Russian official state-sponsored actors. And we do the same thing tracking from official government channels and media channels in China and Iran targeting Spanish language audiences. So the last thing I'll show you let me do this. Let's back up. Our other tool is called the Authoritarian Interference Tracker. And what we do is we track instances of Russian and Chinese um, interference in democracies across the transatlantic community, including Spain. Um, and we've done this for since 2000. We have these cases. Um, and it's not every case of interference, but sort of just uh, a good sample size of the types of, of tools that Russia and China use to interfere in our democracy. So I've pulled up Spain here and you know, see map of Spain, five cases of Russian interference, one China using these three tools, cyber operations, civil society subversion, and information manipulation. And very quickly, I'll just sort of outline the types of cases that we found. There's a case of Chinese hackers targeting Spanish COVID-19 vaccine researchers um, this was happening all over the Western world, but it happened in Spain as well. And the idea was to try to um, either steal proprietary information from um, research, the research community in Spain, or to try to confuse um, Spaniards or Americans about the origins of the co coronavirus. So we've saw we've seen a massive disinformation campaign from the Chinese government trying to um, promote. Um, a narrative that, for example, the COVID-19 virus was started in American re military research facilities. So that's one case. Another was, um, well, a few of them were uh, surrounding Russian involvement, official involvement in the Catalonian independence referendum a few years ago. So I don't need to sort of explain to you what happened in your own country, 
um, with the independence referendum. That's not my place. But um, it, what I will say is we, we've tracked instances of um, Russian government operatives. So this is the Russian military intelligence uh, organization, the GRU. Members of one of their special operations units actually traveled to Catalonia during the independence referendum. And here they were likely giving advice um, to um, sympathetic voices in Spain, um, likely to try to destabilize the country, um, promote disinformation campaigns that would that might work. This is sort of we this is not unique to Spain, by the way. We've seen this in um, other parts of Europe as well, where there were a, a referenda, and um, often there has been a Russian official Russian attempt to amplify pro independence voices in these countries. We've seen this in Scotland as well, in the United Kingdom. Um, and the idea is if your country is divided, it's weaker, um, it's less of a player in the transatlantic community. Um, so there are very real reasons why Russia would be supporting uh, the Catalonian independence referendum in Spain or the Scottish independence referendum in the United Kingdom, um, or in, take a country like Bosnia trying to create uh, or trying to amplify independent voices uh, to divide Bosnia where, you know, that could actually lead to real violence. So this is not unique to Spain, um, but it does show you that there are voices um, in Spanish politics that either wittingly or unwittingly are the target of official Russian actors um, trying to sow further division in your country. So anyway, I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, stop sharing. Okay, there we go. And I think I've spoken probably for too long, but this gives you a sense of the types of threats that we face from abroad that amplify and exacerbate existing threats within our own societies. So again, I don't want to say that Russia and China cause all of our problems. That is not true. We, we are the creators of our own problems. But there are also these foreign actors that have every incentive to try to pour fuel on the fire and make our divisions and make our, our, our tensions and problems in our democracies even worse. So why don't I leave it there? And Christina, maybe I turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, David. Very, very interesting. Thank you for also showing us with that data and with your research um, what this means, because it's not just theory. It, it, it is related to specific campaigns throughout the specific outlets. Uh, let me add two comments, and, and I have myself a question for you. The two comments are, or, or additional information for the students is that RT in Espanol is, as you said, the most watched channel in Latin America in general, because there is a, a, an issue with Latin America is that the media landscape is completely fragmented. Even if most of countries have the same language, they, there are no common um, media there. There is no a single TV channel. Yes, uh, they have CNN in Espanol, but that comes from the US and, and it's, it's you know something uh, not, um, not interpreted as, as Latin America itself. And RT, RT has been filling that void and has cover, is covering many, many countries. And as you said, it's the principal source of this information throughout the, the continent. Um, the second piece of information is that after the um, annexation of Crimea and after the first uh, war in Donbass and so on, the European Commission set up a department called uh, an, an activity called EU versus um, Disinfo. Uh, you can find it online. And it's, as, as you showed uh, with your own institution, it's a tracker of uh, disinformation campaigns. Since 2015, they have recorded up to 15,000 campaigns coming from Russia, mostly, and China. Not only, but mostly. And um, they just released a report on the last three months. They have uh, tracked 100 campaigns. Again, most of them coming from Russia, but as you just mentioned, David, most of them coming from the state. And this is the thing that um, we have seen this information coming from whoever, you know, at the very beginning, 
um, of Facebook, it was done to, to just make money because um, fake news make uh, much more money than, than real news. But now what the European Commission is showing, and, and I'm sure your own work is showing, is that the state, diplomats, uh, ministries are involved in these disinformation campaigns. And one of the most worrying details is that in some of them, China and Russia have somehow collaborated, or at least they, they have coordinated. There, is, there are some commonalities in, in those campaigns. So yeah, it's a worrying landscape. And my question to you, David, um, one of the reasons um, why RT is not making much noise, this, much noise these days in Spain, at least in Europe in general, is because we have banned it. After the beginning of the war, one of the measures that uh, Europe took was banning these outlets because they are not considered real media. They are considered disinformation machines from, um, from uh, rival state. I don't, I don't know how to say it properly, enemies. Uh, and therefore they are considered war tools. Um, but that goes completely against one of the principles of our democracies, which is freedom of, of expression. I wanted to know your opinion on how banning, forbidding certain outlets, forbidding, uh, undermining freedom of expression, uh, how, how far can we go with that uh, in our democratic societies? No, it's a really good question. And it's, it's especially tricky when we're talking about um, media organizations it's a slippery slope, though, in the case of official Russian and Chinese state sponsored media. Well, here we're talking about Russia because of the, the sanctions, uh, the EU sanctions in the aftermath of the invasion of Ukraine. You know, you can make the case that RT, for example, is a media organization. You could also make the case that it's an official propaganda outlet of the Russian government. And if you are trying to impose costs on a country for waging war against its neighbor, you are going to target a lot of its official assets um, in a sanctions package. So I think the EU understandably went over went um, you know it went down a path of sanctioning and batting these official Russian government media organizations, because they were mouthpieces of propaganda, not because they were objective, you know, media news organizations like we have in in, in all of our uh, established uh, democracies. I do think, however, that erring on the side of banning information is not is like that's not healthy for democracy. It's better to present a reader or a viewer with at least a, a disclaimer of where this information is coming from, right? So, you know, what, what a lot of the social media platforms have done now is to label these organizations for what they are. Um, you know, RT is, you know, an official government, Russian government media organization. So at least the reader, the consumer of the information understands, hopefully, um, what's what motivations might be behind this uh, this particular piece of information. I think that's better than just banning things uh, outright. I think once you do that, you know, and we're facing this in our own country, then you leave, there's a whole segment of American society that thinks that like the big tech platforms are censoring conservative voices. Now, I don't think that is true, but when you go down the path of, you know, banning information or sort of obfuscating the sources behind information, then you lead to it leads to a lot of question marks in people's minds, rightly or wrongly, um, about intent um, behind um, certain actions. So it, it's it's dangerous, I think, to just outright ban um, sources of information. But when they are known actors of a warmongering state, and you're trying to impose costs on that state for waging war. I understand and agree with the decision um, by the European Union to sanction our RT. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, we will now open the floor to the students who wants to make a question. Okay, let's open first. Uh, let me change just a bit. 
first I would like to to make use of the hierarchy here and make a, a one question or maybe just to speak something about the the process because uh, I think that we are speaking about a process. This erosion of democracy is not the only one thing. is is just a, a train of events, and I think that I can. Uh, I would like to to make a, a comment on, on this and also to be able to to ask David if if his uh, his insights about. I think that uh, this process uh, start with uh, with distrust. You you say it, uh, in your in your introduction that distrust probably opens a crack in our systems, uh, and uh, through the through this uh, crack, misinformation uh, is a web uh, is a weapon is a weapon to 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 um, uh, take advantage of, of of this breaking point of this uh, crack in the system. And then, uh, and then this uh, goes to, uh, to a goes to a consequence which is instability in in our system. So the process, uh, I think, is in that way. And maybe the the, the crack or the distrust uh, started in 2008, 2009, the the financial crisis, and now we are in a second phase uh, where misinformation become a weapon uh, of conflict. Am I right? Is uh, is that correct? So I I do agree with you, Professor. I mean, distrust doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, distrust comes from somewhere, and I think in 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 your in Spain, in the United States, and sort of across the the, the transatlantic community, there have been I think real. Um, there have been real concerns among many citizens that government stopped working for them. And the financial crisis is one data point. Um, you know, in my country, I think the departure of many working class jobs and the departure of industrial jobs and sort of the concentration of the economy in, in tech and in other sort of non-industrial sectors um, that has sort of laid waste to many um, towns and cities across the country that has led to, I think, an, an understandable um, distrust in in government to actually, you know, provide for its people. And in that void, if you fill it then with misinformation um, or act or political actors who are trying to capitalize on that discontent um, for their own sort of political purposes, it's a really toxic combination. And it's led to, you know, uh, like I, I think I said this in the out, in the outset too, sort of a breakdown of traditional political alliances in a way too. So the whole system is being turned on its head. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think um, there are sources of that distrust and that has led to seeding the information with misinformation that has exacerbated that distrust in, in our societies. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, I, have, I, I have a lot of questions, but I think I, I'm going to, to give room to the students. So which one of you wants to throw the first stone? <laughs> have you any question? Come on, I know you, I know. Yes, Pesca? Uh, in English, please. And loud, maybe. Uh, in yeah, Russian television, we know that it's a, uh, a mostly politicized uh, medium, but uh, if we talk of the uh, mediums of the, well, of, of the United States of Europe, or Europe, uh, Euronews, or uh, uh, F or uh, BBC, uh, we can say that they are not so uh, politicized, or we don't see the polit politicization of that uh, mass mediums. Did you did you hear? It's it's kind of hard to hear because of the echo. So yeah, repeat it, yeah. professor. Uh, uh, Western media 
like BBC, uh, which are others, did you say? Euronews. Uh, Euronews. Uh, uh, what? Reuters. Uh, Reuters. Uh, if they are not politi uh, poli uh, politicized, politi sorry, Christina, the language. <laughs> Politicized. Yeah, if they are if they are politicized and biased. Politicized, okay, politicized. So he's questioning uh, how much politicized are our mass media as well. Yeah. I mean, look, I think I think it's impossible, probably, to eliminate all bias. Uh, in media reporting, and I'm, I, I live with a journalist, so she'd probably kill me if she heard me say this. Um, but I, you know, unconsciously, there, it's the human nature. I do, however, think that like mainstream media organizations do try to uphold like an objective standard of reporting that, for example, RT and Español does not. Um, like there, I draw a very big distinction between official government mouthpieces and the BBC or the New York Times um, or El Pai or any any sort of mainstream Western media organization uh, because I they're not propaganda outlets and even if there is sort of implicit bias in how you know a reporter might see the world they are still trying to adhere to you know specific uh, like the rules and regulations of objective reporting in a way that RT doesn't even try to pretend that it, it is. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I by and large believe that the Western media um, is relatively objective. Now, I do think that the like cable news, for example, um, the sort of privatization and monetization of news has led, you know, to overly politicized commentary, um, sort of dominating actual objective news reporting in a lot of these um, big media companies. So CNN, Fox News, this is particularly problematic in the United States. I won't begin to speak for the Spanish media landscape, but in the United States, it's really problematic because instead of getting just straight reporting from a lot of these cable news shows, you get a lot of opinion. And people then internalize opinion for fact. And now nobody really has a consensus on what the facts are. And that's dangerous. That, I think, has led to more of this polarization, um, more of this distrust in our society, because there's no consensus anymore on what actual objective fact is. Um, you know, I could say today is Tuesday and, you know, somebody on cable news will go and, and tell 30 million Americans that actually it's Wednesday and, you know, and then people are, are wondering what's what's right and what's wrong. And so it's that is, I think, really problematic, in, especially in our media landscape where you have opinion masquerading as actual news. Um, and that, you know, and there's every financial incentive for these companies to run their news organizations that way. That is dangerous. And that may not be like bias in the way that we were talking about it, but it is sort of a distortion of the news environment and the information ecosystem in a way that's really detrimental, I think, to the health of democracy. Hector, if, yeah. if, I, may add, yeah. if I may add something to what uh, David just said, there is, I, which I totally agree with, um, there is um, a researcher here, an expert here in Spain, Nicolás de Pedro, who has been following RT from the very beginning, I mean, from, for many, many years. And in the institution he's linked to, the Institute of, for Straight Craft in London, they showed how they, at, in RT, they make up the news. Um, they, they portray this expert, which is supposedly uh, one of the best experts in the world, this or that, they don't exist. They are, you know, fake people telling stories, inventing stories. And I think that is a major difference with uh, being biased in a Western outlet. Yeah, you have your point of view. Sometimes you have too much opinion. I totally agree. But by and large, we don't make up news uh, with fake people. Okay. Uh, any... Thank you both. Uh, you? Okay. Can you come here and because the, the microphone is here. 
Uh, yes, here. What are some strategies that we as individuals can implement in our life to face this erosion of democracy? Okay, did you hear? Well, I did. Thanks. Great question. Um, when I'm asked this question, I often uh, preface my answer by saying it's going to sound very cheesy and, and cliche, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but participating in democracy is probably the best way to, um, you know, is the best strategy to defending against these types of threats. So, you know, voting and like making a, like, you know, really thinking through what the person you are, who the person you are voting for, what that person represents, um, you know, what kind of worldview does that person represent? Are they are they pro democracy or are they pro autocracy? In my country, that is increasingly being called into question. Where there are like actual people running for office who I I'm not sure actually think democracy is like uh, the form of government that they believe works best for the people. So you know, intention you know the intention behind your participation is really important. Um, really understanding what's behind sources of information you're consuming. Um, understanding whether there's like a government actor behind a source of, of information. Understanding um, whether you're reading opinion or fact. Like the, these, these sound very basic and, and kind of corny, but like it's sort of at the core of like participatory life and democracy. Um, and you know there are there are all sorts of problems in our um, in our laws and in our policies that enable the type of interference from abroad in our democracies. By getting involved in in politics, by you know by working with your local representatives like and making them aware of what these problems are at least you have like an avenue for for um making your own views heard like i i do think that's important that act you know in, in our parliament and congress it really is easy to, as an ordinary citizen to like wage your concern to like raise your concerns with um your representative and be like look i think these policies are enabling Russia and China to meddle in our democracy. Like, here are some things we should do about it. Um, it does sound very elementary, but like participating in democracy is the only way to ensure it survives. Otherwise, you are going to get these actors that, that want to tear it down from within. And that's uh, that's really dangerous. Yes, uh, I, I would like to make a point. Uh, maybe it's cheesy, uh, but it's, it's real because uh, the thing that we are defending here, we, we, we speak about democracy, but we speak about a specific configuration of the system, which is based on plurality and on participation, and even participation between, between rivals. So if we don't participate, we are only uh, giving a chance for one uh, way to solve this problem, which is... Uh, uh, which is to force the system to be more outdoor, uh, 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 more uh, mm, concentrated, more uh, uh, authoritarian. Authoritarian is a word in English. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, if we don't play our part as citizens, uh, we uh, we uh, leave room for any other actors to participate. Uh, so this is why we have to play our part. And also we are not, I think that the society is not, um, cannot clean their hands in the way that uh, we are part of the system. And our political system is also a reflection of us. So they are not just a political system and we are the different society. We are all together in the same system. So if we don't participate and force the system to be like we, want the system to be uh, we are uh, we are giving that shot to to other to other to other actors which are playing that role which wants to play that role so this is my my opinion at least ahora después es una pregunta okay uh, we have another question in the room i will control the time 
Don't worry. No, okay. Uh, uh, you talk about the collaboration with China and Russia. Um, can you give us examples uh, about it and their effects in Europe and Spain? Thank you. Great question. So what we have seen, so Russia really has written the playbook for how to interfere in democracies. And it's been doing this in Soviet times very, very well, especially um, through disinformation and manipulating information. It's been, it has been much better than China or much more effective than China, let's say, um, in waging these information uh, campaigns against Spain, Europe, the United States. China, however, has been learning from Russia. Um, and while it's still not even close to as sophisticated an actor in this space, it is becoming better. So what we've noticed is around really sensitive issues like, like the COVID-19 virus, the war in Ukraine, Chinese official media and government outlets begin mimicking uh, the narratives put forward by RT, by Sputnik, by official Russian government accounts. Um, so there's a lot of um, narrative mirroring between the two governments now. I'm not certain, I can't prove that there's official collaboration going on between Moscow and Beijing, but I'm quite certain that Chinese state-sponsored media are actively watching what RT and Sputnik and Russian government officials are saying and how they're messaging to Spaniards and to Americans, and they're mimicking that and they're amplifying, the, and they're using the same narratives. So for example, about Ukraine, one of the narratives that you will see from China um, in the Spanish language and in the English language is that it's the West that caused Russia to, it, the West provoked Russia to invade Ukraine through NATO expansion, A, and B, all the economic costs that the EU and the United States have imposed on Russia will backfire on the West, that ultimately Russia will be strong um, thanks to its friendship with China, and that really Europe and the United States are suffering as a result of the sanctions that we've imposed on Russia. You see those narratives about Ukraine often from Chinese state-sponsored media um, and, go and government officials. Those came initially from Russia. China didn't invent that. So there is definitely learning that's happening and, and mirroring collaboration in that sort of uh, way in the information space. And I think that's, um, you know, they're clearly more entrenched ties, formal diplomatic ties, economic ties between Russia and China, maybe than ever before. And when you hear President Putin and Xi Jinping talk about the Chinese-Russian relationship, it suggests that it's you know never better. Um, so it, does, it would not surprise me if there were formal sort of exchanges about how to interfere, how to either interfere in government in democracies or how to influence uh, Spanish society, European society, and American society in viewing issues that are important to both Beijing and Russia. So I think, yeah, I think that collaboration does exist. And then, you know, our tools, our research tools that monitor the Chinese and Russian official uh, media space clearly indicates that there is the, they're using the same narratives now um, to talk about these issues to Western societies. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, I think we do have three more questions. Do we have time for three more questions? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Uh, uh, no, you, you first. No, Alvaro, sorry. You. No, no, no. Okay. I'm managing. Um, is it really that important Russian role? I mean, I think the who has brought more instability, at least in the UA, in the last few years, are the countries who have been uh, leading the 
a liberal movement or euroscepticism movement who are also very pretty much against Russia and have been uh, very much in touch also with the United States in the last few years. Okay, thank you. Did you hear? I assume. Just you, to make sure I understood that correctly, the, the question was, were the, are there are there Eurosceptics or others who have? I, I may not have understood the question um, entirely. Okay, I, I, I will. I wanted to ask about the impact of other Eurosceptics on the stability of the United States. Okay, she was questioning if Russia was. Uh, actually important in the instability of uh, the United States uh, because she thinks that maybe the Euro uh, uh, the liberal movement in Europe uh, was more um, effective, not, uh, influential, uh, promoting the instability in the United States. No? no? Europa, Europe. Europa. Yes. De, de... Ah, en Europa. Dímelo en español, por favor. el papel de Rusia en el Estado de la Unión Europea cuando tenemos a los países eurocéticos. Vale, I, I do have a. Okay, yes. She's questioning that if Russia is uh, the, um, the responsible for the instability in, in Europe, because she thinks that the illiberal movements in Europe are responsible for the instability here in the United uh, 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 Europe, uh, in the European Union. Uh, Rather than than Russia, because uh, she thinks that the illiberal movements in Europe are against Putin, which I don't think so. <laughs> but yes, this is my report. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so I I would agree with you, Professor, that I think the liberal movements in Europe largely support um, President Putin, or at least support a, a pro-Russian uh, view of the world. But I do agree that. Homegrown European um, political forces are more dangerous to the stability of Europe and European cohesiveness um, than any foreign actor. And that's, this this goes back to what I was saying at the uh, beginning of my presentation, which is that all of our domestic problems are created by us. So illiberal forces in our own societies. Um, a, a liberal political party is a liberal political actors. They are inherently more dangerous than a foreign actor, short of you know an, an actual military invasion from another country. Um, these are our own problems that we have to wrestle with. My point about Russia and, and China and other authoritarian regimes is they have every interest in supporting and amplifying those voices in our country. So this is why I actually think there's a lot of synergy between um, Euroskeptics, uh, liberal voices in Europe, and um, the ruling regime in Russia. Um, and there's been a lot of contact between um, official Russians and, like, let's say, far right and far left um, parties in Europe, uh, where they're trying to cultivate sympathetic actors um, within Europe, because the Russian government realizes that these are very good proxies to have within Europe to create instability. Uh, and it's no different in the United States. There are far right and far left voices that are more uh, sympathetic to the Russian worldview, either on cultural and religious issues or, or on Ukraine and, and whether we should be supporting Ukraine. Um, and Russia is cultivating those voices too, uh, either wittingly or unwittingly for the, to the actors uh, in the United States. So I, I do believe that um, it is the, do the domestic voices themselves are obviously more dangerous um, to the stability of Europe, the stability of the United States. Um, but there's every incentive for Russia to be cultivating those voices, and, the, and they are. Um, and, you know, lastly, I would just say, because Russia is waging war in Europe against Ukraine, um, it, that inherently makes Russia a more dangerous uh, actor and a more malign 
um, actor and a force for instability than maybe we ever thought it was uh, before. Hector, let me add something to, to that question, which I find interesting, because in Europe, we have started to call the liberal states, uh, mostly Poland and Hungary, just in, in the previous years. There are many others, of course, but those were the two most important countries threatening the, the democratic stability of the European Union. And we have seen a complete um, breaking of that, um, of that line with the war, because Hungary, you are, uh, it is completely pro-Putin, and uh, you know Orban declares himself a, a friend of Putin. Whereas Poland, um, which has suffered, uh, has a, a very a very dramatic history with uh, the former Soviet Union, and it is in the border in the in the in the border with Ukraine, and is receiving the largest amount of refugees and so on. Is completely against Russia nowadays. So um, maybe your your thinking that the liberal countries are the liberal um, factions in Europe are more against Russia comes from that, that Poland is, is uh, at the head of, of, uh, of the support of, of Ukraine and uh, completely against Russia. But as David perfectly explained, it, it goes to, uh, to those uh, populist movements and to, to those who really want to erode democracy from within. Okay, thank you, Christina. Uh, Alvaro, please come forward. We can discuss this in, in the classroom lecture. Hello, I would like to ask uh, about what you said before that. Um, well, I don't think we. Dime, era de lo que olmo que ponía. Que no me acuerdo. He's reviewing his notes. <laughs> Quiere repasarlo y mientras pregunta ella. Básicamente que si una posible solución no podría ser. Vale, ya me acuerdo. Vale, okay. Um, it was about that you said that the best solution was to participate in democracies, but I think that it is important to encourage uh, people to participate. And don't you think that uploading uh, democracies uh, would be more useful than to apply this politic to participate uh, to people who don't find an interest because they don't think that they both are reflected uh, after the elections. Okay, thank you, Alvaro. Uh, no, it's true. It, okay. Sorry. No, no, uh, I, yes. David, yeah, I, I, mean, I think this is the million dollar question. I think, how do you encourage these people in our societies who are skeptical um, to go out and participate and to vote. Um, I think increasingly a lot of these people have decided to participate um, and they've decided to support um, political actors who either openly disparage democracy or, at, you know, at best um, are maybe pro-democracy, but probably are not operating in the best interests of the people who are voting for them, oddly enough. But I think Look, you're right. I, th there's been, I think, a lack of uh, participation and declining trends in participation in our democracies overall, especially among young people um, for a long time. Uh, certainly in the United States, that's that's the case where you have a lot of people who are disinterested or disaffected um, in, in democracy and they, they don't want to vote, they don't want to participate. You know, I've I've, I've long been a proponent of like enlisting celebrities and other like sort of more trusted voices in society to like raise awareness about the good <laughs> of, you know, of democracy and the need to participate, the need to vote. Um, I don't think that politicians anymore are sort of the um, uniting voices who could really drive that sort of uh, participation and sort of build a co sort of a cohesive, um, united view of what it means to be American or what it means to be Spanish anymore. Like it's, it's certainly not in the case of the United States. Maybe in Spain it's a bit different, but I, you know, it, it, our politics are too fragmented. We have to almost transcend that by enlisting voices in our society who are more trusted um, to to really drive participation um, in democracy. And we we haven't seen that 
so far yet. Um, I don't know. Maybe we really, we really need to hit like an actual crisis point. Frankly, I think we've hit a crisis point already. Um, but you know, that hasn't happened yet, and we're still seeing a lot of um, discontent and and a decline in participation as a result. And it's it's really too bad. Uh, okay, thank you, David. I think we have one more one more participant with maybe two questions, two or one. She's not telling me. <laughs> this time for what? Sorry, because of all the technical issues. No worries. Okay. Yes. Hi, uh, I have a question. Like, what do you think that the that could have happened in relation to the Ukraine war? if Trump will still be the USA president. And also I have another question, but it's more like for in relation to the future, like uh, how is going to be the Ukraine government able to stabilize itself after the war? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Small questions, David. <laughs> Those are uh, tough questions to end on, um, but good questions and thanks for them. I If Trump had been president when Russia invaded Ukraine, I actually believe that the US response would have been fairly similar. Um, and here's why. There's more bipartisan consensus about opposing Russia and standing up for um, democracy in Europe than the rhetoric you hear from Washington might lead you to believe. Um, and even in the Trump presidency, when Trump ostensibly admired Putin, um, met with him numerous times, expressed um, admiration for him, um, said he believed him that Russia didn't interfere in the election. Um, in spite of all that, his administration took a pretty tough stance on Russia. Uh, it expanded the sanctions regime against Russia. Um, it worked with Democrats and Republicans in Congress to to pass that legislation as well. And I do think there would have been a real outcry um, to support Ukraine in the face of a full-on invasion. Now, would there have been the same diplomatic effort to rally European support uh, to support Ukraine? I'm not sure. Um, it may have been, you know, I think one of the great um, foreign policy achievements of the Biden administration has been that, you know, the, the State Department and the White House worked very closely with our European allies to come up with a united stance and a united policy um, on supporting Ukraine. I don't know if, if the Trump administration would have put that much effort into uh, consolidating um, Europe's position uh, and aligning it with the United States. I, I don't know. So it's possible that by this point in the war, um, you would start to see much more fragmentation between Washington and, and Brussels and Washington and, and, and European capitals on what the future is um, towards Ukraine. Um, that's all speculation. It's We don't live in that world, so it's hard to know for sure, but that's my best guess. Um, as for the future of, of the Ukrainian government to stabilize itself, boy, you know, it, that question is predicated on an assumption that we even know when the war will end. And I can't possibly tell you when this war is going to end. I frankly think the war is going to go on for years. Um, that's that's my um, sort of sad prediction. Um, I don't think either side has any incentive to come to the negotiating table right now. Um, Russia needs to consolidate some sort of military victory um, in the Donbass to be able to, for Putin to go to his people and claim some sort of victory. And President Zelensky, because the, mili the Ukrainian military has been a has fought so bravely and has held off Russian advances for so long, has no incentive to give up the fight right now. Um, because if he does so, he'll be, he'll be coming to the table, negotiating table from a position of weakness. So I just think that um, this war is going to go on for a very, very long time. Um, and, you know, I think for the Ukrainian government to have any sort of stability in a post-war environment, it's going to need security guarantees from the West of some sort. Now, I don't think Ukraine's ever going to join NATO, so that's off the table.
but some sort of official security guarantee against future Russian aggression will be necessary for Zelensky to agree to any sort of deal at the negotiating table. Otherwise, what will this fight have been for uh, at the end of the day? So I think he's going to need that assurance for the Ukrainian government to be stable going forward. I, I believe that Ukraine's membership in the European Union is actually important um, for any sort of long-term stability um, of the Ukrainian government. And again, like this is a this is ultimately a fight that's it's not just a fight against Russia, it's a fight for something, right? The Ukrainian people are fighting for a, a vision of their country's future, uh, a democratic future in the Euro-Atlantic community. If we just abandon them at the end of the day. Well, you know, what What sort of stability are we helping provide uh, the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian society? So I, you know, I do believe that um, some sort of membership and official membership in the Euro-Atlantic community in some shape or form, and then official security guarantees will go a long way um, to helping the Ukrainian government stabilize along with whatever massive reconstruction uh, foreign assistance package the EU and the United States can offer. Uh, thank you, David. I think we, no, yeah, yes, almost I'm here. We do have a last one. Great. So, yes, uh, sorry for that. No, so, yeah. of course. Um, maybe it's a difficult question, but what is the, or what are the, the factors that can give us strength? Because we are being, let's say, attacked by the authoritarian powers because we are weak so what can we do yes what what is the thing what is the pillar yes the pillars yes 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 he's asking what can we do uh, not only as individuals but as a system to defend ourselves and to 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 build uh, on to build uh, a better structure or a, a, a stronger a, a, a one. Stronger one. Is that all? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I and I also heard like, what are the factors that that give us strength when when because we are being attacked by these authoritarian uh, regimes? I think, you know, I as pessimistic as everything sounds and, and i'm guilty of this too you know i will present and everything i say just sounds like you know we're on the brink of collapse and and, and we're going to lose to these authoritarian countries no I, I don't believe that um i think at the end of the day like our systems have all bent but they haven't broken you know there was a massive interference campaign by an authoritarian regime in my country um that challenged like the core of um, the executive branch of government, the legislative branch of government, the judicial branch of government, um, and we persevered. There was an insurrection in, in our parliament, in our Congress, um, two years ago. Uh, that could have overturned the election, um, the free and fair election of Joe Biden, and reinstalled Donald Trump as president. Um, and that didn't happen. And it didn't happen because members of his own party said, enough, you know, the, democracy will fail if we allow this to happen. Um, so I actually believe that there are enough sources of, of sanity and of belief in democracy to withstand this sort of constant assault by authoritarian uh, actors on our systems. That doesn't mean that they're foolproof. I, I, I don't believe that at all. I think if we aren't vigilant, then, you know, it, you could you could see systems break and not just bend. But I think, you know, democracies are resilient, you know, and there are free and fair elections and, and, and nonviolent transfers of power in all of our countries year after year. Um, and, you know, the, the best things that we can do to generate more strength are elect people who are actually Democrats. And I don't mean Democrats like members of the Democratic Party in the United States. I mean like small D Democrats, people who believe in democracy, um, people who you know believe that the transatlantic community is important and that alliances are important, um, who believe that you know democracies don't go to war. You know, it's th th these are historical facts that have borne out. And 
Um, I, I do believe that if we create more resilience by, you know, promoting these virtues of democracy in our public education systems, by having public service campaigns that enlist trusted voices in our societies um, to reaffirm why democracy is important, why authoritarianism is, is bad. Um, you know, to, if we push back against corruption from within, we're able to generate better defenses um, towards Russia and China and other countries that are sort of actively seeking to undermine um, our own systems. So, you know, I, I, I'll end on that, that little bit of optimism because I actually do believe at the end of the day, our systems are stronger than maybe sometimes we give them credit for. Um, I think the United States is a clear indication of that after everything we've gone through over the last few years. Um, but also Spain, you've had your history as well. That's, you know, maybe even been more um, contentious in this sort of ideological batter, battle between democracy and authoritarianism. So, you know, we've, we've, we've all sort of been through this history and we've come out as democracies. And I think that ought to give us some bit of optimism that we're able to weather these, this like constant bombardment that we're facing from these, these adversaries. Okay, thank you. I don't want to clash with the other, with the other classroom. So I just want to say after I, I give the word to, to Christina when the session, I would like to thank you because I think there are a lot of threads still open that allow me to resonate this session in the forthcoming days so thank you a lot because this this has been fruitful and also very interesting thank you david so christina thank first. you to you professor and to your students yeah thank you david it's been very interesting as, as Hector said you have raised many issues and uh, answered many questions in a in a very understandable and and uh, insightful way too and i also want to thank uh, to thank all the students for their participation and their questions these these sessions are much richer with with you um of course thanks to universidad castilla la mancha for their your collaboration Hector, and to the u.s embassy in spain for making this program possible thank you all you are invited to follow the program via Esloval, and um, we're looking forward to your proposals for the competition thank you bye-bye